I'd like to move to recognize the Honorable Lady from Iloilo in the Republic of the Philippines, no other than Senator Mary Ruiz. Who is going to be recognized? I'm sorry, just one. Right. Mention of the issue that faces us today. Mr. Senate President, Mr. Speaker, and distinguished colleagues of this august Congress. All right. This week, we make history. For the first time, all three branches of government implement the constitutional provision on martial law. What we in Congress do this week could serve as president for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen of the Congress, we are eyeball to eyeball with the history. We start with certain premises. One premise is that a question of law should not be considered as a question of wisdom. Law, particularly the Constitution, is supreme. The elect said let the law is law. The law must be upheld even if it entails heavy sacrifices. Another premise is that Reading the Constitution is not a mere function of literacy. Reading and much more construing the Constitution is a technical skill. We have to follow the rules of constitutional construction collected from various Supreme Court decisions over the ages. The primary aid to constitutional construction is the language of the Constitution. Its words must be given their ordinary meaning. The primary objective is to carry out the intent of the people who ratified it. As the Supreme Court ruled, quote, The Constitution does not derive its force from the convention which framed it, but from the people who ratified it, period, unquote. My request to the Secretary to turn down the volume. I think the microphone is overworking. The intent of the people is gleaned from what the Germans call Zitgeist, or the spirit of the age. In 1986, the people wanted an extremely restricted system of martial law in reaction to what had gone before. I humbly submit that the temper of those times provides the necessary corollary that, in case of doubt, the doubt should be resolved against martial law. Failure to meet the test for martial law. We are here dealing with martial law, which is not formally defined in the Philippine Constitution. And it is not even mentioned at all by the United States Constitution, our template. Permit me to use, therefore, this 1940 definition. Quote, martial law is the law of necessity. Necessity calls it forth. Necessity justifies its exercise and necessity measures the extent and the degree to which it may be employed. That necessity is no formal, artificial, legalistic concept, but an actual and factual one. It is the necessity of taking action to safeguard the state against interruption, riot, disorder, or public calamity. What constitutes necessity is a question of fact in each case. Martial law is the public right of self-defense against a danger threatening the order or the existence of the state. When the ordinary civil authorities, the police, are unable to resist or subdue a disturbance, additional force, military in nature, may be applied. The extent of military force used depends, in each instance, upon the extent of the disturbance." Unquote. Hence, I humbly submit this general test for constitutional martial law. Is martial law a necessity for the existence of our state today? Answer, no. Is it a necessity for the existence of Maguindanao province? No. I further submit this particular test in contradistinction from the general test. Is there an actual rebellion? And does public safety require martial law in Maguindanao? Again, the answer is no. The Constitution imposes two conditions for martial law. There should be a state of actual rebellion, actual, not imminent rebellion, and public necessity requires it. These conditions do not exist in Maguindanao today. The first condition, actual rebellion. The penal code defines the crime of rebellion as, quote, rising publicly and taking arms against the government, 
for the purpose of removing from the allegiance to said government or its laws, the territory of the Republic of the Philippines or any part thereof, or any body of land, naval, or other armed forces, or of depriving the chief executive or the legislature, wholly or partially, of any of their powers and prerogatives." Unquote. In other words, rebellion is open, organized, and armed resistance to established government. If there is such a rebellion, why have never, we never seen such footage in the TV newscasts or on the internet? There should be two groups in the same area, the government troops versus the rebel troops, and they should be shooting to kill at each other. Show me the rebellion. Are we now adopting the new concept of a secret rebellion? That would be a contradiction in terms, an oxymoron, like a woman who is secretly pregnant. Proclamation number 1959, here known as proclamation, does not even claim that there is a state of actual rebellion. Look at your report from Malacanang again. Except for the quotation of the constitutional provision, which of course mentions rebellion, there is no mention of rebellion in the whereas, or introductory portion, or justification for the forthcoming declaration which is the proclamation of martial law. This omission itself is a fatal flaw. Instead, the proclamation claims that, quote, heavily armed groups in the province of Maguindanao have established positions to resist government troops, unquote. The Constitution does not impose the condition that heavily armed groups have established positions to resist. That's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution imposes the condition that there is an actual rebellion.